าสตราจารย์ดักกลาสดีโอเชรอฟได้รับรางวัลโนเบลสาขาฟิสิกส์เมื่อปีคิตศักราช1996จากการค้นพบความเป็นของไหลยิ่งยวดในธาตุไอโซโทปฮีเลียม3ถือเป็นการค้นพบที่เป็นประโยชน์ต่อวงการวิทยาศาสตร์เป็นอย่างมากและก่อให้เกิดการศึกษาและวิจัยด้านของไหลยิ่งยวดซึ่งมีประโยชน์ในการศึกษาปรากฏการณ์อื่นๆในธรรมชาติเช่นการศึกษาการก่อตัวของแกลล็กซีในยุคเริ่มต้นของจักรวาลปัจจุบันศาสตราจารย์ดักกลาสดีโอเชรอฟอายุ67ปีเป็นศาสตราจารย์สาขาฟิสิกส์มหาวิทยาลัยสแตนฟอร์ดซึ่งในครั้งนี้ท่านได้ให้เกียรติมาแบ่งปันความรู้และสร้างแรงบันดาลใจในการเรียนวิทยาศาสตร์และตอบคำถามจากนักเรียนโรงเรียนต่างๆทั่วประเทศ Well it's my pleasure to be here today and, and I suppose uh, this session uh, is supposed to pique your curiosity and so I should tell you some some interesting things about myself uh, I I was uh, one of five children my father was a medical doctor and he was quite often uh, Patching me up after something exploded. I was very interested in in uh, high voltage electricity and gunpowder when I was your age, and uh, I we lived at the edge of town, so it was relatively easy to do things like this. Uh, I was into rockets and and all sorts of other things, and I I suppose I'm very fortunate to have. Survived my childhood, so I, I do not recommend that you do all the things that I did, because you have to be indeed very lucky to survive. So I, uh, you heard that that I did my undergraduate work at Caltech, and of course this was during the period of time uh, that Richard Feynman was teaching uh, the undergraduates. Richard Feynman. คือนักฟิสิกส์ผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลเมื่อปี1965และเป็นหนึ่งใน10สุดยอดนักฟิสิกส์โลกตลอดกาลจากผลการสำรวจของ Physics World เมื่อตอนที่เขาเป็นอาจารย์อยู่ที่สถาบันเทคโนโลยีแห่งแคลิฟอร์เนียหรือ Cal Tech คุณโอเชรอฟซึ่งเป็นนักศึกษาอยู่ในเวลานั้นจึงมีโอกาสได้เข้าเลคเชอร์วิชาของริชาร์ดไฟแมนด้วย So everyone even those that were majoring in, in fields like history Had to take two years of Feynman physics, which I think uh, for some of the students felt that that was cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but uh, I think most of us felt that Richard Feynman was our idol and uh, the, the, our great leader. So Feynman, of course, was a very curious character. In fact, he, in fact, described himself as being a very curious character. So. He, he has all sorts of. He likes to do things unconventionally, and uh, eventually, I was being offered a job uh, at Caltech, uh, and and so I uh, was. I took this opportunity to talk to to Richard Feynman, and I and I said that that someone at Bell Laboratories had suggested that he was going to uh, a host uh, Feynman's visit. Uh, at 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 Bell Laboratories, that's in Murray Hill, New Jersey, uh, in the the uh, summertime, and and I I said you don't want to come to New Jersey during the summertime because it's very hot and humid like it is here, I suppose. <laughs> and and uh, so, as if Feynman didn't know, he grew up in New York City, so he knew how bad it was. And I said, "Why don't Why don't you actually come in the springtime? It's a very nice time of the year." And so we sort of agreed. And then somehow I ended up being the, his host. And it's of course, yeah, I was very nervous about hosting someone as famous as Richard Feynman. Uh, so eventually, he said at one point, he said, "All right, I'm 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 Dick, and you're Doug, and we shake hands and say, 'Let's start out all over again. I'm just an ordinary person, and you're an ordinary person, and we'll go from there.'" And uh, so Feynman had brought his daughter with him, uh, Michelle Feynman, and uh, I was responsible for for entertaining her somehow, and so. I I didn't know much about Michelle Feynman except I knew she was very interested in horses, 
So there was someone at Bell Laboratories whose wife uh, ran a, a, a horse stable for handicapped youngsters. Most of these uh, youngsters were blind, I think. Uh, so it must have been quite scary to be on top of a, something as tall as a horse, but maybe, in fact, you didn't actually know how high off the ground you were. Uh, we showed him around to, to the various research labs, and he talked to a lot of people. And then it was time for his talk. And uh, so, you know, Feynman, the, the, first of all, the Arnold Auditorium at Bell Laboratories was completely packed. There were, I mean, the fire marshals would have probably closed us down because there was no way for people to get out. The, all of the, the, the stairways and all of the pathways were all crowded with, with people. Then he started giving his talk. And, of course, uh, Feynman was you know, really interesting person, but what he talked about, I was very disappointed. He talked about reversible computers. Now, the, the thing about a reversible computer is for any process to be reversible, it has to occur slowly. Otherwise, for instance, if you're talking about having charge running on and off the gate of a field effect transistor, if, if the charge moves very fast, it dissipates energy. And, and so uh, I was, uh, he, he was talking about processes that are very unrealistic in the sense that the last thing you want is a computer that goes very slowly. So I was very disappointed, but at the end uh, he asked for questions and the questions went on for two hours. And uh, suddenly I realized that, that Feynman knew very well, much better than I knew, what his audience was interested in. These were all engineers that were in the process of, of making devices that used transistors in them. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't say anything out of turn. But uh, Feynman was a, a, an interesting character. There's no question about that. There's a very interesting book, uh, Michelle Feynman, who's Feynman's daughter actually put a book together, and I can't remember the name of it now, but if you have a chance of finding a book uh, written by Michelle Feynman, it's, it, it, I think you'll find it quite interesting. Well, I, as I said, I, I grew up on, uh, I, would, I would guess, mostly gunpowder and high-voltage electricity. Uh, it turns out I grew up in a logging town in, in the Pacific Northwest, and in fact, my first summer job after I, I uh, graduated from high school, I, I worked in, in a sawmill, and then my s second summer and then third summer after graduating from high school, I worked in paper mills. So I mean, these were really, this was hard physical labor, and. I suspect that m most of you won't enjoy the opportunity of working that hard, hopefully ever in your life. There was one night when I was working very hard, I lost 10 pounds, it was all water because I was working so hard. But, but in fact, uh, uh, it was kind of interesting to see how people that, that didn't go on to universities uh, worked. And it's, it's not something that you want to do. That's all I can say. So, uh, look, I, th I think what we should do is you, ha you know a little bit about me, uh, and uh, so why don't we just open the floor to questions. You can ask me questions, and I'll try to answer them. Who wants to be first? Hello, my name is Hanap Lejin Ying Tawi. I study in a whoops, home schools, homeschooling. And the question is, in the future, in 10 to 20 years, what science carry path will be the most important? And is you have any chance to combine all three subjects in science? Well, you've asked a very good question. And unfortunately, I don't think anyone really knows the answer to that question right now. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, that's what uh, I think, uh, you know, we have to look toward the future and, and see, try to anticipate, you know, what, what uh, uh, first of all, what the opportunities are. Uh, because as, as uh, you know, society progresses, uh, we, we come up with interesting ideas, and those ideas result in new technologies, and those technologies allow man to do new and different things. And, and so it's, it's kind of very difficult to guess, you know, what, what will be important and what will be available to us 20 years from now. Uh, so, so I can't answer your question, 
But I think it's a very good question, and I think it's something that we all want to look forward and try to anticipate what the future will bring. So thank you very much, and I'm sorry I cannot answer your question. <laughs> That's fine. Would you like to ask another question? Uh, and in the past, science developed from the philosophies, but now science is gearing out and out and now because mathematics is gearing out from the philosophies. And is any way that the science will come back to the philosophy? Because now some people comment that it's start to come back to philosophies, and some people don't use mathematics in science. Well, I think it's hard to do science without mathematics, but, but uh, you know, I think uh, what you're talking about is what I would call natural philosophy. And, and I think it's, I will give you the, the answer which in, I suppose my high school chemistry teacher would have said something like that. Uh, he came in class one day and he had inside, he had a milk carton and, and there was something inside the milk carton and he said every time you do an experiment, you're asking a question of nature. Nature has to answer your questions, but nature's answers aren't, and then he shook this thing, said, what's in the milk carton, but rather something about what's in the milk carton. And so then you have to ask nature an, a, another question. And the idea is to trick nature into giving up one of her secrets. And, and I th in fact, I will show you a picture of my chemistry teacher. Sadly, he died before I got the Nobel Prize, but in fact, he was, I think, uh, one of my great heroes. And uh, uh, I think the way he thought about doing research is the way I still think about doing it today. Thank you, that, that was a wonderful question. <laughs>